<clears throat> now, this uh, first phonetic sound that you hear, B, Bismillah, B, is translated in, is translated with, both. It can be translated also by, by, depending on the word situation, the word uh, environment for the word for the for the B, the context in which it is used or put. Now let's look at another expression from Quran for this B. God says, and really this one, I'm hoping I'm setting the tone or the mood for my address with this quote from Allah's book, the Quran, and from our book, the Quran. La yughayru, la yughayru ma ma La yughayru ma hatta yughayru ma bianfusihim. God does not change or remove what is bothering a people until they change or remove from themselves what is bothering their souls. Now let us have a few comments on that expression. Islam, past, present, future. I know where I'm going. Don't think I'm forgetting. Let's have a few comments on this expression. And let me correct those who translate it wrong wrongly. And it's not just you. In fact, you never translate. You never translate. I haven't seen any of you all translate. You buy others' translations. You don't translate. I hope you will follow me and become translators yourself sometimes. Yeah. All right. There's a translation that they give. Overseas Muslims who came to America. It's not a popular translation among them. It's the, it's the unpopular translation among them. Translated like this only by a few. God does not change what is bothering a people until they change it themselves. That's how they translate it. Well, if I change it myself, what I need God? I don't need God. Now, what kind of ridiculous statement is that? God doesn't change your people that's bothering the people until they change it themselves. I don't need him to change it. I changed it already. Now, why is he coming to change? I, I've already, already changed what bothered me. Why, why, why does he have to come and change? So it really puts God out of the, out of the question, doesn't it? It puts God out of the question. That statement is saying this, don't depend on God, don't wait on God, don't expect God to do something for you, do it yourself. That's what that statement is saying. So this is coming from the atheistic thinkers in the community of Muslims, immigrant Muslims, those who are atheistic. It's coming from them. They say, oh, don't wait on God, don't trust God, take your matters into your own hand. That's the only help gonna come to you is from yourself. God is not saying that at all. And every natural human person in this audience today, and those that this uh, speech will reach, or this address will reach, over the national broadcast or through the publications, they know what I'm going to give. They know it's the truth. You know it because your own good nature tells you. Now I'm going to tell you exactly what God is saying. I haven't, this is not the first time. I've done this many times. Explain this expression in the Quran. It is plainly said, God gave it clear and plain that God does not change what is bothering a people. What is wrong with a people? What's the matter with a people? What is bothering a people? What is burdening a people? That's what it means. Until they change or remove what is bothering their souls. That's what it is. That's clear. You don't need to translate it anymore. That's clear enough. But let's have a few comments on it. What, 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 when you, when you are not in the proper condition, when you are not yourself in the right condition, 
to get God's help. It's because something is wrong in you. God will help us if we are if we are all right. If we are right, you don't have to be sinless. God helps sinners. We know that. You don't have to be sinless. Moses was a sinner, and God called Moses to be his prophet. Peace be upon Moses. So, so we, know, we know that God helps sinners, so you don't have to be holy and perfect and pure and angelic to get God's help. But you just have to be truthful. Truthful. Your soul tells you that you ain't right yourself. That you need to shape up. That you need to work on your own self. Your soul is telling you that. And sometimes you, you'll be so good in your own soul, in your own soul, uh, that you won't really feel that I have to do something about them. I'm a pretty good fella. I'm the best best fella in this, in this town. You know, you won't be bragging, but say, hey, I'm, my morals and uh, nature, and tongue is straight, clean as anybody in this town. So you feel good about yourself. But you got sinners and liars and thieves all around you. And you are not helping them get out of that condition. So still, you have the burden on your soul. It's not because of you being so bad, but you now, you are in a good shape and good condition, and you won't help others. So your own soul tells you that. When you ain't doing what you should do by other people, your own soul lets you know that. So God created us to act upon the good voice in our own souls. And he's not going to come and help us when we are closing the ear to that good voice of our own soul. You won't listen to your good voice of your own soul? Why should God come and help you? But once you start to listen to the good voice in your own soul and respect it, then God is going to come and give you all the help you need. Not as you think God should do it, as God knows how to, uh, to do it, as God knows to do it. He's going to take care of you. That's all you have to do is be true to your own self. Hmm? And God will help you. Now, don't forget what I'm saying here. All this is necessary in this address. <clears throat> now, here comes Islam by name, not by content, by name. Here comes Islam into the Christian neighborhoods of the most deprived citizens of America. The poor, in many ways, poor culturally and poor in the pocket. Poor pockets, poor minds. Poverty of the intellect and poverty of the money, the purse, or the pocket, pockets. And the way it comes in, it comes in as a mystery, or at least as something that mystifies, mystifies. And it's... <clears throat> It starts to work in the minds of these poorly informed mentally and poor in the pocket African Americans who were Christians before. And it makes them a kind of special student or students of the teachings <coughs> of. W. Farad Muhammad, W.D. Farad, and his opponent's helper, my father, Elijah Muhammad. 
who was given the name Muhammad from his teacher who was not from America, Farad. His name was Elijah Poole, from, uh, born in Sandersville, Georgia, from this state, Georgia. So uh, <clears throat> we have one time period for Islam among us. Now, we have to acknowledge that there was the, the Moorish American Science Temple existing a few years before Farad started his Temple of Islam under the honor of Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. That was the Moorish Science Temple. And when my uh, father first taught or lectured, preached or taught or lectured, gave lessons to the Fruit of Islam, called FOI by us, the FOI, Fruit of Islam, the military unit for men in the nation of Islam. My father was put in a dress <clears throat> like the Moorish Americans were. Farad's first uh, influence on the way we dress gave us the Moorish American Science Temple dress. The men wore fezzes, wine color fezzes, with black tarsal. Now I've told you all about this, but I'm fortunate today to have a gentleman in the audience wearing one. So I want you all to turn around and look at this gentleman. Would you please stand for me, brother? You see, the, see this head, head gear, the head, head piece? That's exactly, we still got the pit portrait, we still got the, the group picture of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, the captain in those days, the supreme captain, and the fruit. We still got the picture, and that's how they were dressed, just like that. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Now, all right. <clears throat> During the time period, beginning with 30, 1931, although we're told officially in the documents of the Nation of Islam, that Mr. Farad came July the 4th, 1930, that that's when he came to our community to do his work. <clears throat> I think that that's more symbolic than it is factual. But we know that in uh, 1931, he was preaching in Detroit in the most deprived areas of the black community or the African American community. <clears throat> Up until the Honorable Elijah Muhammad went to prison for refusing to carry a draft card, not only did he refuse to be inducted, he refused to carry a draft card. And many of his uh, men with him followed him. They were beyond induction age. If they had just gotten a car, they could have spared themselves. They wouldn't have had to go to jail if they just had accepted a car because they were too old to be inducted into the army. But they took his position and they went to jail. They gave my father five years and sent him to Milan, Michigan, federal institution there, to do his time. And many followed him. My brother was one of my oldest brother was one of them. He was young enough. He was right. He was he was just in the right age to be inducted, but um, he didn't accept the card either, and they were put in jail. This is the past. We're talking on the past now. This is the past. <clears throat> in the prison, in the jail, my father didn't stop preaching. He preached in the jail like he preached outside and actually made converse in the jail. One of the converse he made, the name was Andrew, Brother Andrew. Brother Andrew was a young man. He was in jail for some crime. He converted to the Nation of Islam while he was in jail. He came out before my father was released. And he, my father had trained him to be a minister. He started ministering in Chicago. 
he became our minister, Brother Andrew. Uh, and a very good one he was. <clears throat> so this is kind of giving you a picture of the beginning. What distinguished the men, or I have to say the congregation, the following, from the present was that they were mostly thinking about and interested in the lessons or the teachings of Mr. Farrar. That's what they were interested in. To become a member, you had to write a letter. And your letter had to say, Dear Savior, and you completed it letting the Honorable Elijah Muhammad know, you're writing it not to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad though, you're writing it to W.D. Farad. Dear Savior, and you're saying that you want to accept your own. And if that letter was written nice and clear, you would be accepted. But if you misspelled words or your handwriting was not clear, they would send it back to you, you had to write another letter. Now you didn't have to know anything about <clears throat> the teachings to get your letter approved. You only had to be able to write a clear letter with the words spelled correctly, punctuated, the sentence punctuated correctly, and not sloppy. So what, what was your, what was the price you had to pay to get in? to become a member. You had to write clearly, correctly, neatly, and be clean. You send a dirty letter, it's going to come back to you. Yeah, you got some dirt on it, it's coming back to you. They'll send it back to you, they do it again. They wouldn't accept it until it was correct, neat, clean. All right? So shouldn't that tell us what the emphasis was on? I don't care what you learned after you got in. Shouldn't that tell you what they wanted most of all? To have you respect knowledge, try to learn to, to read and write correctly, be neat and clean. So that was the emphasis. That was the most important thing for you. And you were the most I would say uneducated of your people, of our people, all right? And the poorest in material resources, the poorest, all right? Now, when you, after you came in, it was very wisely done, very wisely done. Now here you coming in, right away they know what kind of people they got. You couldn't get in until you respected authority and instructions. If you don't respect authority and instructions, you can't pass. And they got people that will accept to be neat and accept to be clean. So they're not worried about any um, My I'll say tongues popping up. Or Nat Turner's popping up. These are not people who are going to start in a revolution in our, in our, in our midst, our, our revolt, our trouble. These are people that have proven that they will accept our authority and obey. So you're guaranteed and a, a following that you can manage. Because they don't even let them in until they show that they respect your authority and do what you say. All right? Now, I don't think you're the only ones that wrote letters. There are plenty of others wrote letters that they never got in because they wouldn't respect authority. They couldn't take instructions. They couldn't be neat and clean. They never got in. No way. Not back then. Now you didn't change. Somebody may be giving you a letter, but I don't. I don't know about it. It's a secret. You don't give out letters anymore. 
<laughs> and you couldn't write your own letter. You, they gave you the letter and told you to write this letter. You, you couldn't compose it yourself. You got the letter from headquarters. And you had to put, make a letter exactly like that letter. 